Thank you, Matthew. All right. So for the past uh, month, we've been focused on uh, studying our calling and how we can live that out in faith and obedience. Uh, the church calling men to serve as deacons, but also coming to terms with the call on every one of our lives to serve Christ and his kingdom. And so if you have your Bibles, you can look with me in Luke chapter 22 today. I'll just remind you, if you came in late, the official ballot for deacons today is the yellow ballot. I don't want you to be disenfranchised, so use the yellow ballot. You can vote for one or all or none of these candidates or some of them, but uh, I'm voting for all of them, if you're wanting to know. Uh, I think that the Lord is calling out these guys to serve, and I'm thankful for that, but you vote as the Lord is leading you. Those can be put in the baskets by the doors if you haven't already uh, put them somewhere also we're asking our church members only to vote once the Lord is watching so. All right so the office of deacon in our church derives its title from one of the most significant New Testament words to describe the nature of our callings as Christians, and how we are to live that calling. So this is, a, this is one of the most significant words in the New Testament that shapes our presence with one another and our presence in the world in which we live. Now the word deacon itself comes from the Greek word diakonos. And in the New Testament, this word is generally translated as servant into English, and it describes one who ministers to and cares for others. Now, primarily in Greek, this has the idea of menial service, such as waiting on tables. Uh, usually, when it's used to describe people in God's kingdom, it's describing people who are serving, who have a servant's heart. It can also refer to those who serve in the office of deacon, and the significant that as an office, the title is taken from this word that refers to waiting on tables, someone who is a servant. So Jesus used this word to convey his radical ideal of human relationships in the church and in the kingdom of God as mutual service involving self-sacrifice. So it was natural that this word came to represent all kinds of service in the cause of the gospel. So in Luke, that we're going to read today in the 22nd chapter, this is, the narrative takes place uh, in the upper room. It's the night that Jesus will be betrayed and arrested, and he will go to trial. The next day he will be crucified. So Luke describes in the 22nd chapter, how Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper as a visible reminder of the unity of believers with each other and with Christ. It's also a reminder of Jesus' sacrifice on their behalf. And he calls them to follow his example of sacrifice for the sake of others. Now in John 13, in John's account of this time in the upper room, John has Jesus washing their feet as well as calling them to serve each other in the way that Jesus served them. And so you have this extraordinary time of intimacy of Jesus trying to communicate some timeless truth to them that shape the way they are to relate to him and to one another from then on. This is some of the most significant time, not just for these 12 disciples, but for all of us who follow Christ. I wish I could have been there, especially to see what happened next, because things go south. Let's look at the text, Luke 22, starting with verse 24. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. And Jesus said to them, 
The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. So we need to understand Jesus' point here. If we are going to faithfully call out men to serve in the office of deacon within our church, we also need to understand what Jesus is saying if we intend to follow Jesus with faith and obedience in the times in which we live. So, what is Jesus telling us? I have three things to point out to you this morning, okay? Are you ready? Good. Let's do this. Number one, after the disciples argued over who was the greatest or most important, Jesus points out their worldly perspective. So again, in the upper room discourse, everything's going great, and then the disciples... Uh, do what they've apparently done all along. They begin to uh, snipe at one another to see who is the best or the greatest. And what Luke tells us is, is very vivid. The disciples got into a contentious dispute over who was the most important among them. And the language Luke uses describes an argument. This is not a friendly debate or discussion. They are not jabbing one another in a good-naturedly way. They're fighting. It's a, it's a passionate debate. It got heated. And the topic they're arguing with one another about is which one of us is the greatest. This likely centers around who is going to have what role in the kingdom that Jesus brings. Because you remember, the disciples completely misunderstood everything Jesus had told them, right? Hello? Hello? Yeah, so they were expecting something different. And this is an ongoing argument for them. This is not the first time this subject has come up. In Mark chapter 10, James and John go to Jesus and they ask him for places of honor and authority in his kingdom. And uh, remember, that didn't go well. All the disciples got mad about that. And then in Matthew chapter 20, we are told that uh, James and John's pushy mother goes to Jesus and asks him, did I say that out loud? The mother of James and John, the wife of Zebedee, goes to Jesus on behalf of her sons and wants him to give her boys positions of honor and authority in his kingdom. And again, all of the disciples become angry and they begin to fight with one another. Obviously, this was an important topic to these disciples as they jockeyed for positions of honor and authority in the kingdom of God. Now, it's important to understand that that word translated in my Bible for greatest has the idea of most important. Who is superior? Who is the most important among them? In other words, you have to get this right. Who's the most important one? Because we have to know whose interests are going to be served. Whose will is going to be done? Whose needs are going to be met first? Who gets to have the final word? Who gets a seat at the table? Who gets to be in the room where it happens? That's what they want to know. Who is the most important one? Who gets to have the say? And so after listening to this and probably rolling his eyes, Jesus observes that the disciples' attitude of self-importance reflects the attitude of leaders found in the unbelieving world. And Jesus speaks about rulers in the unbelieving world who exercise their authority over the nations and they've titled themselves as benefactors, which is an important uh, title in the ancient world, and it reflects how they think you are supposed to view their authority. It benefits you some way, right? 
So when I exercise my authority over you, you benefit as a result. Isn't that nice? Do you buy any of that? The promotion of power dynamics where some benefited at the expense of others is what Jesus is describing. It was common at the time. Rulers had the right to expect special and deferential treatment from those over whom they had authority. This was the way things went. The question I want to ask myself is this. Am I prone to inflate my own grandiosity and self-importance at the expense of others while I claim to follow Jesus as Lord? Because this is exactly what the disciples were doing. In other words, have I made myself the most important person in the world? Have I become the ultimate consumer, insisting that the circumstances I am in and the people that I'm with all work together for my purposes, my comfort, and my fulfillment? I've thought about a lot about this this week. I have some great stories to tell about this how members of this church and other churches have put their own self-importance and grandiosity on display at the expense of others. I have a lot of stories. I can't tell any of them. I'm going to write a book when I retire. How many times have members of a church been hurt by those who insisted that church decisions benefit them and not others. Hey, I know you don't like to get up early, but nobody here needs to tell me how much they dislike the 8.30 worship service time. Are you listening to me? I already know. There are reasons why we do it this way. And you don't need to tell me how much more you would like it if we would switch back. Because it's not happening. <laughs> Instead, Jesus points us to a better way. Listen to this. The second thing I want to tell you is that Jesus redefines greatness, prestige, honor, influence, and leadership for his disciples in his kingdom which is significance, is found only in lowliness and service. The contrast between how the world views importance and power and influence and how Jesus understood it could not be greater. And Jesus absolutely steers his disciples away from promoting their own self-interest and replaces it with something different. Jesus emphatically states that his followers will not live by their own sense of self-importance the way unbelievers do. In other words, the followers of Jesus, especially these apostles, are not to exercise power, authority, influence, or use opportunities to fulfill themselves at the expense of others. It is important to note that Jesus does not say that there are to be no leaders. Rather, he says that leaders are to serve something beyond their own self-interest. In the study of leadership and group dynamics, power is often defined as the capacity or the ability to influence others. People have power as a result of formal positions of authority they may have. They also have power that as a result of their personal connections and relationships with others. You have positional power, you have personal power, and in both ways you and I have the capacity to influence others. Look at what Jesus is saying. The Christ follower with personal or positional power is to willingly relate to people and situations as if they had none. So he says, the one who is greater among you, that is the one with a position of authority and leadership, is to be like the younger among you, the youngest. In that culture, the youngest sibling did all the menial tasks. 
and they were the servants of the older siblings. Any youngest children here? That's me. Rotten older brothers and sisters. It was expected, if you were the youngest, that you were the least important. And Jesus is saying, as leaders, the apostles are to serve without insisting on being served. They were not to exploit people or opportunities for their own interests. In other words, people are to be loved, not used to fulfill our desires. Jesus also says that the Christ follower with personal or positional power is to put that power in service to others. So he says that the one who rules is to act like the one who waits on tables, the one who serves. The commitment is not to power or privilege, but to service. And so greatness or importance is defined as service, not authority. Importance is found in the power not not to take and exercise control, but in the ability to give and share. And sacrifice. So the question I want to ask is, have I placed my personal or positional power, authority, or influence at the service of Christ to others? Am I using what influence I have to fulfill my own purposes, or have I placed that at the service of Christ to others? The last thing I want to point out to you is that the reason I would willingly choose the pattern of a lowly servant in all my relationships and circumstances is because Jesus did. And I can't overstate this point. Why would any sane person behave in this way in 21st century America? Why would we willingly choose not to live as consumers looking out for our own best interests? The answer is because of the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And that either resonates with you or it doesn't. And I'm going to tell you, I speak to a lot of people about leadership. I teach formal and informal classes on this. This is a hard sell for people who live out there in the real world. Is service actually leadership? It seems contradictory. And so the whole concept of servanthood sounds nice, but is not realistic, unless you claim Jesus is Lord. That changes everything. So look at what Jesus says. Jesus was greater and deserved to be served at the table. Instead, he was among his disciples as a servant. From the world's perspective, Jesus says, who's the greater one? Is it the one who sits at the table, or is it the one who serves those who are sitting at the table? And obviously the answer is, well, the greater one, the most important one, is the one who is being served while they are sitting at the table. And Jesus says, that's right, but what am I doing? I'm among you as one who has served, who serves. And Jesus has already washed their feet including the feet of Judas Iscariot, who's about to betray him. He serves. And so Jesus confronts the disciples and all of us with a contrast and a choice. If Jesus is great, and he does not live like the rest of the world, how should I live? So it's fair to ask at this point, if Jesus is among us as one who serves, What or who did Jesus serve? There's two answers to this question. First of all, Jesus served his Father's mission. In John 6, 38, Jesus says, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. See, Jesus was all about doing what his Father wanted. And when Jesus stood in his hometown synagogue and he read Uh, From the prophet Isaiah, he spelled out his mission for everyone to hear. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. How Jesus led, everything he said, everything he did, flowed from a clear sense of why he had come in the first place. And what I'm telling you is that mission is everything for followers of Jesus Christ, especially those who are called to lead. The mission and purposes of God are the focus of every decision and action we make together. I am called to humble myself and carry out God's purposes rather than my own personal agenda. Every now and then, we start talking about the rights of church members. And I guess that's okay. But I feel like it's a, we're barking up the wrong tree. Are you following me? We are called to the Father's purposes, not to exercise our rights. The second answer to the question of whom or what Jesus served, is that Jesus served those who were working to accomplish his Father's mission. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now this explains why I would humbly submit and look to meeting the needs of everybody else in the body of Christ, because Jesus did. He did not come to get his way, to insist on his way, or to be served in any way, but to look to the interests and the needs of others. And he calls me to follow his example. I am called to be a servant to those who are on mission with me. As I seek to fulfill God's purposes, I actively recruit and build up others to join me. I want to equip and encourage and lift up others so that they and we together can accomplish God's purposes. That is the most important thing. Amen. You may not be convinced. We are conditioned by our culture and our sinful appetites to think church is supposed to meet our needs when in reality, church involvement is an opportunity to find fulfillment in serving the purposes of God and meeting the needs of others. You are either convinced of that or you're not. There are consumers all in our culture. We find them right here in the church. But this is the truth of things. Our involvement here is to accomplish God's purposes, and to meet the needs of others, and to trust that by doing that, I'll find my greatest fulfillment as a person and accomplish what I was created uh, to accomplish here on planet Earth. To think about all of this, I want you to think about the Michelin Man. Are you familiar with the Michelin Man? So... The Michelin rating system in the culinary world has the power to make or break the world's finest restaurants. It's called the Michelin Star System. The same company that makes tires today makes or breaks restaurants. And here's how it happened. In 1889, the Michelin brothers founded the tire company in France. It was extremely successful, they were innovative, they became very influential. By the early 20th century, the Michelins launched guides and maps to promote the purchase of automobiles and automobile travel. These guides provided information on routes, hotels, restaurants, and other travel-related services. One of their clever moves was to highlight what they called food worth traveling for. And so by covering restaurants with standout regional cuisine, they enticed drivers to explore farther, and naturally they needed sturdy Michelin tires for their journeys. In 1926, 
the Michelin Guide began awarding Michelin star ratings to fine dining establishments in France, and eventually that spread to restaurants all over the world. Initially, there was only one star awarded, but in 1931, a hierarchy of zero, one, two, and three stars was introduced. Unlike most star ratings, one star is not considered a demerit. It actually signifies a fine dining establishment. To even get one was extraordinary. Today's restaurants may receive zero to three stars for the quality of their food based on five criteria. Are you ready? Quality of the ingredients used, mastery of flavor and cooking techniques, the personality of the chef and his cuisine, value for the money, and consistency between visits. Woo! Now, they use a different symbol, the fork and the spoon. Show the next one. Yeah. So the fork and the spoon symbols are used to rate the restaurant's interior decor, table settings, and service quality. Now, here's what you need to know. First, there are no restaurants in Texas with a Michelin star. That's right. Not even Whataburger, which is baffling to me. And so there's a good chance that nobody in this room has ever dined at one of these fine dining establishments. So let me tell you what it's like. Restaurants with Michelin stars are usually booked up each night for months in advance. They know how many people will be dining and they know who these customers are. The restaurants employ an army of people each night to create a world-class dining experience. So here's a list of all of the people involved in serving these fine diners. You have the executive chef who's the head of the kitchen who's responsible for menu creation, food quality, overall culinary vision. The head chef designs the menus, ensuring creativity and balance, oversees the kitchen staff, including hiring and training, and maintains high culinary standards. Then you have the sous chef, who's the second in command, who manages the kitchen and assists with menu planning and ensures that kitchen hygiene is followed. You have the pastry chef who specializes in desserts and pastries and maintains an inventory of pastry ingredients. You have the sommelier who's the wine expert who assists guests in wine selection and ensures proper wine service. You have the maitre d' or the host or hostess who is the front of house manager. This person greets the guests, manages reservations, coordinates seating and ensures smooth service flow. This person handles guest inquiry and special requests. You have the server and all the wait staff who directly interact with the guests. They take orders, they serve food and beverages, they provide menu recommendations, they ensure guest satisfaction. You have the captain who is the senior server who oversees the wait staff, handles VIP guests, and coordinates service timing. Now, the maitre d', the servers, and the captain do research on each guest and they know the pertinent details of their lives and any relevant current information. They keep detailed records on each return customer, their likes, their dislikes, their food sensitivities and allergies and so on. Guests are greeted by name and seated at preferred tables. You also have the bartender who tends bar and interacts with guests. You have the runner who supports servers, delivers food from the kitchen to the table, assists with table setup and ensures timely service. You have the busser who clears and resets tables, removes used dishes and utensils, refills water, glasses, and assists servers as needed. You have the dishwasher who ensures clean dishware, washes dishes, glassware, and utensils. You have the assistant host or hostess who supports the maitre d' and handles reservations and escorts guests to their tables. You have the food expediter in the kitchen who coordinates kitchen service, who ensures correct plating and timing and communicates between the kitchen and the servers. The 
expediter maintains quality control. And then you have the cloakroom attendant who manages guest belongings, provides excellent customer service. You have the valets out in the parking lot. Need I go on? All of these roles work together harmoniously to create an unforgettable and personalized fine dining experience where impeccable service and exquisite cuisine meet together to delight all their guests. And the guests come back and willingly pay between $400 and $2,000 a person for a meal like this. Let me say that again for those of you at home. $400 to $2,000 a person to have this kind of experience. And I kid you not, this process plays itself out every night, all year round. And it takes all these people doing a million different things at the same time, every night, all for the purpose of creating a one-of-a-kind dining experience. Each member of the team must value creating that experience. It explains why they do it. They love to serve the customers. They want to create and be a part of this special experience. It provides the reason why they work so hard together. And you understand that this doesn't work if the workers are only concerned about their own interests. If they're concerned about the interests of the customers, then everything will be just fine. When they start asserting their own rights, and that the servers should be treated like the mater d, then that's when things begin to fall apart. Here's what I'm saying. In the church, we must be committed to serving a larger purpose beyond our self-interest. And if you and I insist on our self-interest being served, everything is going to fall apart. The mission of our church is to lead all people to be shaped by the love of Jesus Christ. The mission of this church is not to provide a worship time that's convenient for your sleep schedule. Are you following me? It takes a small army of paid staff and volunteers working together, doing a million different things every day, every week, week upon week, month after month, year after year, to accomplish our mission. Each person must value the service to Jesus and to others. That explains the extraordinary commitment required every day, every week, every month, every year to accomplish the mission of this church. People love Jesus, and they love serving him and others. It won't work if church members are only concerned about their own interests. I have only hard jobs here that require extraordinary commitments. Are you called to serve? It's okay if the answer is no. Not everyone can do it. But some are called. And the church depends on those people to show up and to do what they're called. I'll close with this thought. Uh, Gene Wilkes, my PhD supervisor, he said this, and I'm paraphrasing. The test of whether I've accepted Jesus' teaching on serving is found in how I respond when I am treated like a servant. The greatest compliment I can give you is to call you a servant of the Lord. Do we have any of those? That is what this church needs. That's what this community needs. That's what our country needs. People who are going to serve Christ and his purposes and willingly, sacrificially serve others who are serving Christ and his purposes. All right. Well, since you applauded, let's wrap this up. <laughs> this morning, I invite you to think about three things. First of all, I invite you to accept Jesus' call to service. By dying to yourself, 
laying aside your self-importance, and willingly choose to follow Jesus Christ. Look, I know you have needs. I know you have interests, you have passions, you're, you want things, you don't want other things. I get all of that, and you're important to me. But all of us need to take seriously the call of the Lord on our lives. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Secondly, I invite you to place your personal and positional power, authority, influence, and influence at the service of Christ to others. Was that a rooster? I'm trying to wrap it up. I invite you to place your personal and positional power and influence at the service of Christ to others. You have the capacity to influence people in your life. Are you influencing them to serve your own interests? Or are you influencing them in the cause of Christ? Finally, I invite you to make a commitment to choose the pattern of a lowly servant in all your relationships and circumstances because Jesus did. There's really no other reason why. It's because of what Jesus did. His example is to shape all of our examples, all of our relationships, and all of our circumstances. So in a moment, I'll pray, and then Matthew's going to come and lead us in a time of response. And I wonder, who is the Lord calling out to serve? Who will answer the call? Who will follow the example of Christ? And so you can, you can respond to what God is telling you right where you are while we sing, but if you feel led, you can come to the altar and pray. I'll be standing here if you want to come and pray with me. And then when the service is over, I'm going to be out in the foyer for a time. I would love to visit with you about you know, how to join the church or what God is saying to you in the text or, 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 or whatever's on your heart. How do you need to respond to the word of the Lord? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you that Jesus Christ loved you and valued your will that he willingly became one of us and offered his flesh and blood as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. And now our sin is forgiven and the perfection and righteousness of Jesus is counted as our own because he served your purposes. And Lord, he served others especially those who were called to accomplish your purposes. And so, Lord, may his example shape our lives today so that we would lay down our rights, our sense of being important, our agendas, that we would willingly submit our positional or personal power and influence to you for your purposes. And Lord, in all of our circumstances and relationships, I pray that you would reveal to us how we can serve so that your will is accomplished. And I recognize, Lord, this is a hard thing that doesn't resonate with everybody, but I believe there are some who are ready for this, who are called to this. And there are many in our presence who live this out daily. I pray that you would multiply their tribe. This is what the world needs, because this is the example of Christ. And now may your will be done. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, would you stand with me while we sing today?